so what I want to talk about today is some work that my collaborators and I have done over the last few years on the topic of using uh, deep learning and in par and particular deep generative modeling as priors for inverse problems. Now this work that I'm going to talk about is almost entirely all theoretical. So just to orient you that you know, we're, you know, our, our goal is really like theorems, recovery theorems for guarantees that if we solve inverse problems using generative priors, that we get the right answer. Right? Uh, so just to, to set the stage, right? so we're, uh, we're going to look at uh, inverse problems. We're going to look at ones that are of the form of like denoising or like uh, compressed sensing, phase retrieval. Uh, there'll be some others that I mention here. But here the, the story will be I have some signal x naught. We should think of this as an image. I have some measurements of x naught. Let's call that A of x naught. And these could be partial measurements. They could be noisy measurements. They could be indirect measurements, uh, depending on the domain and the problem of interest. And the goal is going to be to go from A of x naught back to x naught. Now, a central challenge of this is that due to the noise that's in the measurements, due to the relatively few measurements that you're going to have, there's going to be some, uh, uh, often some underdeterminedness, and you're going to have to select one of many potential images that are consistent with your data, and that requires using some sort of prior, some sort of understanding of the real world, uh, which, which makes some things natural and some things unnatural, and you'll choose the things that are most natural. All right, so just to jump you know, into like, how can we use generative models for inverse problems, I'll, I'll start by saying what, what I'm going to present today is just one possible way of doing this. Uh, so we're going to look at a type of generative model that is kind of as follows. There's going to be like the step one where you're going to train something called a generative model. Uh, this model is going to be a function, usually represented as a neural network, uh, that's going to take some low dimensional input and some high dimensional output, such as these images. So here, what you see in, in part one is if you feed some noise into this, uh, this neural network, you get some images of flowers that are out. This net was trained to generate flowers. Um, all right, so not all generative models are you know, of this form, where it takes something low dimensional and hands you something high dimensional. There's a lot of very interesting work that's uh, done over the last few years about like, score-based nets and other approaches uh, that, are, that are not of this form. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, what I want to focus on are, is theory for recovery using generative models of the form where they are functions of a low dimensional latent space into high dimensional signal space. All right, so step one is go train that generative model. And so I'll defer, you know, conversation on how to do that to sort of like the study of computer science, but roughly you have a large data set, there's algorithms for doing this, things called GANs, et cetera, that uh, allow you to build such a function. All right, uh, yes? Just a quick question. So this is the model you're going to stick with uh, during your whole talk, yeah? Yes. Because we try like differently, uh, basically saying like the generative model models a PDF of the signal, yes. Uh, so likelihood, how likely is a certain signal, so to say, and then you can also use it as a prior, basically by using one or whatever. Yes, as a penalty. So that's not what you're gonna do. Right, right. So, so in this work, I'm gonna present theory for these models that are specifically of the flavor that they take a low dimensional. Uh, latent code, map it to so high dimensional space, meaning that, uh, so we're going to assume that the range of this generative model is going to be our set of natural images, some particular natural signal class, and we're going to assume that the image of interest is in that class. Now, this is going to create some challenges down the road in that what if an image is not in that in, in the range of that manifold, uh, and then you get you know, challenges with representation error, and then there are many approaches, uh, for example, ones that specifically model PDFs of, uh, of uh, the distribution of natural images that, that really help solve those problems. Uh, but for recovery theory, it's, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's usually some assumption of some low complexity level that's going to enable recovery guarantee. And in this case, we're going to bake that low complexity into the generative model itself. Uh, whereas like some, some other, other generative models that really output an entire distribution, uh, it's kind of hard to put your finger on the low complexity that's, that's in those models, though it must be there somehow, or else they wouldn't be working at selecting the natural images from, from undersampled measurements. 
All right, so, so step one, train this generative model. So then step two, once you have the generative model, keep in mind you've trained it not knowing what you're going to use it for. Uh, step two is now you have some measurement operator A, you have some, uh, some, uh, some image that you have the measurements of, so let's call that X naught, and then you could write down a least squares problem uh, to optimize over the input to this generative model G for what's most consistent with the measurements that you have. And so here you can see it says minimize over this latent code Z in our K. So K is the dimensionality of the manifold that is expressed by the range of this generative model. So you have a k-dimensional search, uh, and this results in sort of a non-convex least squares problem. The non-convexity is baked into G and to some extent in A. Uh, all right, so uh, formulations like this, you know, one, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll cite the, this paper by uh, Bora, Jalal, Demakis, and Price that, you know, very much popularized this idea of using generative models for inverse problems such as compressed sensing. All right, so now uh, to get you the, the structure of this talk, what I want to do is present really a recovery theory in a particular case of random generative priors, and I'll explain what that means and I'll justify that in a few slides. And I want to show you that this theory applies for multiple inverse problems and then talk about extensions of that theory that have happened uh, over the last few years. So for the first part of the talk, I'll I'll discuss compressed sensing, what this theory, uh, what, what modeling assumptions we're going to make, what conclusions we're going to be able to prove about recovery guarantees in the case of compressed sensing. Then we're going to study it in the cases of denoising, compressive phase retrieval, spike matrix recovery, just to show that this theory is actually extensible to a variety of inverse problems. And then after that, I want to show a, a variety of extensions that um, uh, other groups have, have worked on to extend this to, to the assumptions of the model to be more realistic. And of course, there's much more work to do. Um, what I find that's really exciting about this work is, you know, the, you know, the Working with neural networks is very, very challenging. Trying to get rigorous recovery guarantees using nets is challenging, and this is one framework in which we really can get provable guarantees with uh, efficient algorithms for working with neural nets. Now, of course, there are some trade-offs and caveats I have to say you know, to make that claim, uh, and we'll discuss that as we go along. All right, so let's, let's jump into this first part about compressed sensing. Right? And I want to take some inspiration from the canonical theory of compressed sensing because this is the, the sort of thing we want to replicate. All right, so, so the normal theory of compressed sensing since about 2004 is a very impactful field. Uh, has generally been focused on the idea of a sparsity prior, where you might model your signal in an appropriate basis as being sparse, meaning that it has relatively few non-zero coefficients. And so then there are techniques for how do you impose that sparsity when you're recovering signals from undersampled data. Uh, so just to fast forward to sort of the, a, a, a key theorem of this field, is that if your sensing measurement matrix uh, is random Gaussian, the number of measurements you have is on the order of k log n, and your signal has sparsity k, then if you solve this linear program that's in the middle of the slide, uh, then with high probability you get the exact uh, signal x naught, well, well, with high probability you get x naught as the output of this linear program. And so the thing that I want to point out here is there's an efficient algorithm there's a structural prior that's assumed, that it's a sparsity prior. The, there's a complexity to that prior, which is to say it's a k sparse, so there's really k de degrees of freedom there. The number of measurements that you need is proportional to k, there are some log factors hanging out. Right? So that's, this is what we want to replicate. We want to pay attention to the complexity of the prior, the algorithm for optimization, for solving this, uh, and to show that if we do have enough measurements, hopefully relatively few measurements, we can get exactly the right answer, or approximately the right answer if we're in the presence of noise. All right, so this is the standard, the standard result from sparsity-based compressed sensing, which we're trying to replicate in this, uh, in this more complicated situation of uh, deep neural network priors. All right, so now to, to just visualize what's going on with uh, compressed sensing with this generative model, I just want to, to show this, even though this is a bit redundant from what I said before, uh, but a lot of this is just to set, really, to set the notation. All right, so, so we have a generative model, we'll call this G. Think, think of this as it's a neural network. 
right? It takes a low dimensional input, we'll call some true input Z naught, uh, that's going to give you G of Z naught, which we'll call X naught. That's the image of interest that you are trying to recover. So here we're assuming that the image of interest is in the range of G, but you can also ask questions about what happens if it's not in the range of G. Uh, so we have this image X naught. We don't know X naught. That's what we're trying to find. Uh, so we have access to, say, linear measurements on X naught, so AX naught, and from those we're trying to get back to Z naught. So if we could get Z naught, then we could push it through G, that would give us uh, an estimate of X naught. All right, and so then here's the, uh, the sort of this pro problem that we wrote down before on the other slide, except here it's where A is a linear operator, and so now this is uh, a least squares problem. It is non-convex because G is you know, generally in our, an arbitrary neural network. Um, all right, so, so how is this possible? Right? So I, I want to present this, this picture that like why does recovering something using that algorithm make sense? And so, so think in this picture on the right hand side, the ambient space is like the set of all images. Now most images are not very interesting because they look like static. So there's, you know, there's some sub-manifold or there's some manifold of images that are my, like natural images. And then maybe there's some sub-manifold of that, which is some natural signal class. You know, maybe the set of MRI images or the set of uh, whatever, whatever you know, microscopy images or you know, whatever your domain that you're from is. Uh, there is some manifold that you could use to model that. So now there are measurements that you have of this signal. These measurements in this case are linear. They are undersampled, meaning you have fewer of them than pixels in the image. So that means there's, you know, by elementary linear algebra, there's an affine space of images that are consistent with your measurements. That's drawn by this, uh, this uh, solid black line. And the idea is that that solid black line intersects this manifold at exactly one point, if everything sort of goes our way. All right, uh, and so then here, this manifold, this, you should think of this as a k-dimensional object. So how many uh, measurements do I need to pin down a k-dimensional thing? I should have approximately k such measurements. All right, uh, so that's the picture of what's going on. And uh, hopefully, we're going to get a theory that says that if I have about k measurements, then I can find my signal exactly. All right, uh, so I'm going to jump straight into the model. Right, so with this, there's going to be a lot of assumptions that are made on this page, but I just want to get them all out there. So we're, we're looking at neural networks, so we need a canonical neural network. So, uh, you know, neural nets are very complicated. They have all these inner workings and batch normalization and activation functions and linear operators and convolutions. Um, so as a starting point, we sort of stepped back and just said, like, fundamentally, like, what is a neural network? That's right, a sequence of linear and nonlinear operations that are in order in like D layers. Uh, and so here we're saying like we're considering like the simplest thing that could reasonably be called a neural network. Uh, so we take our input Z, you hit it with a matrix W. So these you should think of as weights. Uh, and then you're going to have a rail U activation function, which will keep the positive part, kill the negative parts. Uh, then feed that into another matrix and then keep the positive parts of those and do this D times. So this looks like a neural network. Uh, some comments are, you know, we didn't study with the bias terms. Uh, so normally you would have bias that's added to them. Normally you'd have extra bells and whistles, but we are not uh, studying those because we have to start somewhere. Um, all right, so each of these Ws, for now you should think of them as tall matrices, right? At the end of the day, what is a generative model doing in this, uh, uh, under the, the structure that we're assuming? It's going from some low dimensional, highly compressed representation to a high dimensional, highly redundant representation like an image. So roughly speaking, the size of the, the, the widths of the neural network are going to increase with depth, even though that's not strictly always the case. But morally speaking, you're going from something small to large. So we're going to assume that this network is go at each layer is going to become wider and wider until you get to some terminal, you know, final width. Um, all right, so we have our weight matrices W. Uh, we have some sensing matrix A. This is just the same as in uh, canonical, you know, sparsity-based compressed sensing. So think of M as small and N as the number of pixels in the image. Uh, and so then Y is A times G of Z naught. So that's your measurements. You could think there could be additive noise uh, if you like. Uh, and the goal is to find X naught. Right? So now the assumptions that we're going to make 
we're going to assume that this network is expansive, and meaning each, each layer of the net is wider than the previous layer, and there's a particular growth rate. So let's say like the width of the ith layer n sub i is like the width of the previous layer times an extra logarithmic factor. So this just makes sure it just keeps growing sufficiently for various technical reasons. Um, we're also going to assume that the weights of the neural network are Gaussian. Now, this is a relatively strong assumption. Right? So in training neural networks, you'll start with something that might have Gaussian weights. Then you're going to feed it data and optimize some functions. And then you're going to no longer have Gaussian weights. Uh, but we're going to study this in the case of a purely Gaussian W. Now, there are some various rationalizations that you can provide to, to argue that that's not too crazy of a thing to do. You know, there's, there's some theory out there that's saying that, like, as you train neural networks, often the weights don't actually shift very much from where they are initialized, and this is sort of more valid the more over-parameterized the nets are. You know, so that's one sort of approach. Another comment is you can look at trained nets and look at statistics of those, and you can see that there are, you know, approximate bell curves and some of the, the weights and the biases of those nets. Um, but nonetheless, uh, like, it's really not clear what model you really should be using to study trained neural nets. I mean, for me to make a claim about a trained neural net is a very bold sort of thing to do because, I mean, I don't know what a cat or a dog is, let alone what a net trained on images of cats and dogs are. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? How, how are you going to keep the independence when you are training? Uh, so, so here, yeah, so, so, there, so there is an assumption in the work of independence. And so that independence is, is only enforced within layers. Um, but certainly that independence is lost while training. Um, that's, you know, that's just, uh, that, that's what happens. Yeah. Uh, so, but for the, uh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, why, why do you assume the imaging operator also to be ID Gaussian? What does it mean? So, so here, the, so the, the imaging operator, like, Often in practice, that's going to hand you the form of the operator, right? Like it might be like a random part of the Fourier transform or something. Yeah, um, sure, but why is it not fixed? So, so A, well, you can think of A as fixed, but being from a random distribution. Like in the same way, if we go back to the, the sparsity perspective of compressed sensing, right there, that A is often studied as being a random object. And so then sort of the theory in, in standard sparsity-based compressed sensing is that like, if the A satisfies something called a restricted isometry property, then you can prove recovery guarantees. And then it just so happens that randomly generated A's satisfy that, that deterministic condition. So, so yes, A is fixed. In, in standard compressed sensing, it needs to satisfy RIP to really enjoy this theory. And if we generate A in a particular way, it, it does satisfy RIP. Okay, so you have you are mainly having the compressed sensing picture in mind here. Yes. Because like if you had tomography or whatever, that would be fixed, right? Uh, completely, and there would be no randomness. Right, and I, I mean, and I, I haven't kept up super up to date on my sparsity-based compressed sensing, but I know that at least as of a few years ago, the concept of building deterministic matrices that satisfy the restricted RIP was like a subject of like active work, and was kind of like. A, you know, a, a significant challenge in the field. Um, so I, like, I, I wanted to be able to, you know, we, in, in our work, we wanted to be able to just focus on, like, can we get recovery guarantees with neural network priors making, you know, as reasonable of assumptions as we can. Uh, and so the, the A being random is a standard assumption from the previous field of compressed sensing. Oh. All right. Let's see. Is there anything else I wanted to say about this? So the point was, it's a D-layer, fully connected neural network with no biases and rail activations. That's the, that's, that's the summary. It's getting wider at each, uh, at each level, when, and the weights we're assuming to be fixed and Gaussian. Um, a is a fixed and Gaussian. And then when you're doing your optimization, you're optimizing over Z. So that's what I mean when W is fixed and, um, and uh, um, A is fixed. It's fixed over the optimization of Z. All right. Uh, okay, so so we can we we can get. I'm going to jump to the punchline. You know, what's the theorem here? 
right, the theorem, and, and this is work done, you know, very interesting work with uh, Wen Huang, who's now a professor in China, and Reinhard Heckel, who's in this room, myself, and Vlad Vorninsky, who's the CEO of a self-driving startup, a self-driving car startup. And here the, the, the comment is as follows. So if my model is a expansive Gaussian neural network as described on the previous slide, and if the number of measurements scales like K with some additional factors that depend on D and N, uh, uh, and assuming the measurements have sufficiently small noise, then with high probability, a subgradient descent algorithm with a twist, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, converges to within the noise level of the true solution Z0. Right, so just remember the setup. We're assuming that the image that you're observing is in the range of G. So this is to say your G is good enough to actually model the things that you're trying to recover from it. What's being plotted here on the right is the objective function, that, um, that nonlinear least squares problem, that non-convex least squares problem. Um, is, so is that objective in this random Gaussian case? So you can see on the bottom right of that, there's this sort of global minimum. That's the point Z0. Um, then you can see there's some little crazy thing happens at zero because you know, all these are these rail use and there's no biases. So you know, it's, it's just a little technical what, what's going on at zero, but it's local max. Um, there's this sort of spurious local minimum that's on the opposite side of zero. But otherwise, this, this, this landscape looks pretty reasonable. Um, and the way, the way this theorem works in some like grand sense is to say that the random system really isn't that far from optimizing this function, and optimizing this function isn't that hard. You can just visually like run a gradient descent yourself downhill, and you can see that, okay, you might get stuck in the region on the left, uh, but generally speaking, optimizing that is not very hard, even though it's non-convex. Uh, all right, so I said, uh, you know, there's a subgradient algorithm with a twist, Right, so what is the twist? The twist is, you know, we have, the, there happens to be this spurious local minimizer, uh, and it happens to be a negative multiple of the true solution. So at each step in the, in the gradient descent, you're gonna check yourself and your negative and see which one's better and just go to, the, go to your negative if it's better than where you are, right? So we're not like proposing this as, you know, a competitive method for, for real practical use, but it's just showing that like, we, we need to do that as a technical thing just so that we can really prove guarantees of recovery no matter where you start. Um, all right, so, so let's look at what are the key things here, right? We had a random model for G, we had a random sensing matrix, we had a number of measurements that scales like K. Right, so K is the dimensionality of the manifold that we're modeling the, the natural image class with. And so we want this to scale like K. We could not possibly beat that. Um, though there are these additional factors, D, log, these product events, you can, you know, those we didn't optimize, those you could beat, you could clean that up. Um, and, um, and, and I mean, I'm talking some things under the rug about how small is small noise, but it gets very technical very quickly and perhaps not so interesting for, for a talk. I refer you to the paper uh, if you're interested. Um, all right, so this is, this is the, the, the theorem. Now, the way this theorem is proved is actually very similar to the, the standard compressed sensing work. Right? So in that work, there were deterministic conditions, which if you met, then you get the recovery guarantee. And then a random system you can show satisfies those deterministic conditions with high probability. So in standard compressed sensing, this is all about the restricted isometry property. Uh, here, we need to introduce deterministic conditions. And then we'll show that random situ uh, situations satisfy them. And then uh, that's how this, uh, how this theorem works. All right, so now, I mean, now is where we start getting like a, a, a bit more technical, but just to show you like this, the first, there's two deterministic conditions we introduce. One is called the weight distribution condition. Uh, and so we'll say that a weight matrix, so think of this again as a tall matrix. Um, uh, it, we'll say that that satisfies a weight distribution condition if this particular matrix or let's say I you know, think of my weight matrix, each of the rows, it's like a single neuron, its weights in terms of as dependent on the input to that neuron. Um, so I'm gonna look at these matrices WI, WI transpose. So take one of those rows, take the outer product of it with itself. There's a lot of rail use in my system 
And so those values are either you know, kind of active or inactive based on whether the input has a positive dot product with a weight or a negative dot product with a weight. So if we look at the, the sum of these, these WW transposes, but only including them if that particular ReLU is active, um, then this, that is a matrix. That needs to be close to this matrix we'll call Q, and here's an analytical form that Q has to have. You can think of Q as, well, it's literally an isometry if X equals Y. If X is equal to minus Y, then every component gets removed, and so it's zero. Uh, and then at various angles in between, there's some particular function that it has to have. So this is like a generalization of saying that like the matrix WW transpose is an isometry. It's just now it depends on, you know, there's really this random function of X and Y, and it's not an isometry in all, for all X and Y, it's only an isometry for some, but there's just some particular relationship that, that has to be satisfied. Um, all right, if you ask where does this Q come from, it comes from the expected value of that sum on the left if W is Gaussian. Uh, theta is the angle between X and Y. Uh, and so here, this is, this is saying, right, so we have like this, this sum on the left, that's a, a, a random function of X and Y given by the weights. The randomness is due to W being random. For any X and Y, some of those weights are active and some of those weights are not active. And so then if you compute out what, what is the expected value of the left-hand term in the case of... Uh, let, me, let me make it sh sure that I understand it. Uh, you say W is, uh, is that independent, identically distributed uh, quantities or not? Well, let's, uh, for simplicity, let's assume that all items in W are IID N01 random variables. Then, uh, after training them, you, they are not anymore independent. Right. It is, it is true. After training, they're not independent. After training, they're not Gaussian. But, but um, then how you prove the a theorem if you prove something now using the independence and then you say that it doesn't, uh, you cannot retain it. Right, so, so the, the comment... That's a confusion, I, I just want you to... Right, so, so the theory that I'm presenting is like under these assumptions, I'm making this conclusion, right? So the assumptions are that this combination, like this matrix in terms of the weights are close to what you would get if they were all IID Gaussian. So now there's wiggle room in here for maybe you're not exactly IID Gaussian, but nonetheless, like these Wishart type matrices are still approximately what they are in the IID Gaussian case. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I can't make a strong claim about exactly what two trained neural networks do. Uh, and I assure you there's a considerable amount of very technical mathematics, even in the case of, um, of, of pure IID Gaussian assumptions. Um, all right, so here, this is a, a technical, uh, it's a technical but deterministic condition saying that the weights are approximately what you would get if they were IID Gaussian. Um, and so then there's, there's a different condition, call this the range restricted isometry condition. And basically what this says is if you take any pair of secant lines in the range of G, then the matrix A acts like an isometry on those. Right? And so here, uh, that's very similar to what you get in the case of uh, sort of in, in the case of standard compressed sensing. That's that's very similar to what uh, some of the, the conditions are there. Uh, so basically, restricted to the range of the generative model, your sensing matrix acts like an isometry. That that that's all it's saying. Um, and so so okay. So I said the theorem was proven by assuming deterministic conditions. Uh, and so then now we, we can like simplify this theorem. If you satisfy the WDC and you satisfy the RRIC and these hold with, you know, there's some parameter epsilon that they hold and that's small in, in terms of a polynomial in D and the measurement noise is small also, you know, in, in a, with a particular scaling, then the subgrading algorithm converges. All right, so, so this, is, this is the equivalent to saying if you have restricted isometry property for sparsity-based compressed sensing, then your L1 um, optimization works. So the... the so you, you've removed the, with high probability here, 
I yes, this is now no longer a random statement. Yeah. yeah, so here we have a deterministic claim, and then we're going to show that these hold with high, with high probability. Yeah. Um, all right, and so, you know, so, so there's, not, there's not too much new that, that's, uh, that's on this side, but it just says that the WDC holds with high probability in the Gaussian case. Uh, and this is sort of a, a, a tricky thing, right? So when we, when we look at this term, we're like, I, I have these like random vectors. Uh, I'm forming this like Vichar type matrix, but I'm only including, like this is a function of X and Y. I'm only including each term if the relevant rail U is active. So this is a random function of X and Y. It's a random matrix valued function of X and Y that is discontinuous. Right, if I change x so that it flips on one side of a w, all of a sudden I have a, 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 a jump. Now, the standard approach for proving concentration of terms like the left side to its expectation, it usually goes like saying, assume it's like Lipschitz, then plop down a bunch of points, and show that it concentrates on those points, and then use the Lipschitzness to like get, you know, use continuity to, to get control on the other points. But this whole thing isn't even uh, continuous. So we had to just like really finagle it to get, uh, to show, you know, concentration of this discontinuous matrix valued random function. Um, this is sort of the, mo the most interesting thing from a technical perspective. Um, I'd be happy to chat about it. Um, but it's like, this is really like the, the central thing that made the whole theorem work. No, the whole theory work. Um, and then, and then the, the range-restricted isometry condition, this really is just a straightforward generalization of the sorts of things that happen in, in standard compressed sensing. Uh, there's, this, there's this result from Berenik that's basically like, give me some subspaces, like if the dimensions are reasonable and I have enough measurements, then, um, then the, a random matrix A uh, is an approximate isometry. This is very close to like a Johnson Lindenstrauss type, uh, type, type perspective. Uh, and so if you want to establish our more complicated isometry condition, then we look at all subspaces given by all ReLU patterns of the neural network. So that's a combinatorial number of possible subspaces that we have to control, very similar to the standard compressed sensing case, uh, and then just do a union bound over all of those. So there, there then comes in some like beautiful like sphere covering type arguments for controlling the, the number of such uh, subspaces. Um, all right. Uh, okay, so, so that was just meant to show you like sort of the, this, this technical theory for if you do have Gaussian neural networks uh, that are sufficiently expansive, then you can use them to solve compressed sensing at optimal sample complexity in the complex in, in the dimensionality of your modeled manifold. Okay. So the, in this the second part of the talk, I want to show you that this sort of idea like also extends to other problems, and in other problems have actually led to like significant advances in the understanding of those problems. So let, let's start with the like the compressive phase retrieval problem. All right. So the compressive phase retrieval problem is is of this form. It's similar to before except that the measurement operator, instead of being a linear A acting on X naught, is like the absolute value of A acting on X naught. So in practice, you could think of A as being like a subsampled Fourier transform, um, but we're gonna think of A as being Gaussian. Um, but nonetheless, we still have absolute value of A of X naught, that's our measurements, how do we get uh, Z? Uh, and so then here's this formulation that I worked on with my former graduate student, Oscar Leong, who's now a postdoc at Harvard. Um, or excuse me, a postdoc at Caltech, uh, and then Vlad Borninsky. Uh, and so then, you know, there's this particular formulation. Uh, there's a reason why I wrote it down that way, but I won't go into those details. Uh, and the point is, we're going to study theoretically, like, can we prove recovery guarantees for the phase retrieval problem uh, in with this uh, optimization problem? Um, so before I, before I go into theory, I will show some experimental results. Uh, this is just a, a, a proof of concept with MNIST data. So here's some digits on top. Uh, we trained, a, you know, very we took a trained variational autoencoder, which uh, you know um, generates those digits, uh, and then we compared that optimization problem that I was written down on the previous slide. Uh, to various other approaches, including like Sparta, which really like leverages the sparsity 
of, um, of the system. Uh, and then in, in certain regimes, this uh, deep phase retrieval can outperform those methods. Uh, yes. To build your generative model, you take an autoencoder, you run your representative data set through it, and then you crop it, or is there another solution? To use so there, so so I mean, the, the variational autoencoder is a generative model that's trained, you know, for the purpose of being a generative model. Okay. Yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, generally speaking, I, well, yeah. So it, it's just one of many ways that you could train a generative model, but it's not the same as training an autoencoder and just chopping it. And so I understand the religion. When you put a random input to a generative model, does it always output something that is like? looks like it belonged to the data set, or is, there like, is it a rare occurrence? Yeah, if, if you successfully trained it, that will be the case. Okay, thanks. No. And of course, now, you might not have successfully trained it, um, but, uh, but generally, yes. Um, uh, I do not see the connection to the normal phase retrieval where you measure intensity, you want to get the complex field with the phase, with the MNIST uh, figures here. What's the, the phase? So here, so, so here the... So like the, the phase retrieval problem like in practice would, you know, would be written like this with an A that's handed to you from the physics. For example, A is a Fourier transform. Yeah. So we're, I mean, proving things with the Fourier measurements is quite challenging. So we're, we're gonna seek to prove things with what we'll call generic measurements, i.e. Gaussian measurements. So, so some people call this the generalized phase retrieval problem where A is Gaussian. And so then in this case, we're taking those signals, hitting it with a, a Gaussian A of uh, some number of, you know, so, of some particular height. Right. right, so it's not, I mean, it's not a real, like, you know, this is not like a crystal of that shape that you shine x-rays through. Right? This is just a, a absolute value of Gaussian measurements. Yeah. And so, so the point here is that if, if you use these generative models as priors, you can com compete with and in some cases beat sort of the existing algorithms that are really trying to leverage the, the sparsity structure of those, um, uh, of those signal classes. Uh, and then we'll come back to, you know, thinking about like how does deep generative modeling compare to making sparsity priors uh, and have a few things to, to say about that. Uh, and then just showing, you know, some, some like reconstruction error versus the number of measurements. You can see in, the, in this blue curve, these, uh, this, this like deep generative modeling based approach can, can get low reconstruction errors for significantly fewer measurements than other approaches that require, uh, that involve like sparsity priors or, or other assumptions. Um, I'll point out that on this blue curve, you also see that it saturates Right? And this goes back to a question from before, leading to like the concept of representation error. What if your image isn't really in the range of your generative model? Then you have challenges. Uh, and then there's a whole sets of approaches for dealing with those challenges, which uh, is out of the scope of the theory that I want to talk about. Um, all right, so so the the theory for compressed sense or the theory for compressive phase retrieval is actually essentially the same as the theory for compressed sensing. In fact, it subsumes it. Um, and I'm gonna show you an old theorem because a, a new theorem is, is, under, is under review. Um, but in this, in this case, you know, we're looking at compressive phase retrieval with Gaussian measurements. Uh, so if the number of measurements is proportional to K up to log factors, you know, the network's sufficiently expansive, the weights are Gaussian, everything's Gaussian, um, then the, the objective has a nice, landscape for optimization, which is to say um, we can give you, like the gradient gives you a point that goes downhill everywhere, um, and you know, there's only two regions where you have issues. One's a local minimum, that's the spurious point that I mentioned before, one's the global minimum. Uh, and so then uh, here this shows you that like the optimization landscape, or the landscape of the objective function is favorable for optimization. Now, we've subsequently gone and improved this theorem to say the subgradient descent algorithm converges. Uh, and that, you know, required significant, like, technical work to show, like, approximate, like, convexity around the minimum solution, which is actually quite difficult because, again, all the gradients of this are discontinuous and all that fun stuff. Um, but uh, the same story holds. 
Like if you have a random Gaussian prior, you have number of measurements proportional to K, then a subgrading algorithm converges to your minimizer, um, provided you have the little twist. Um, all right, so, so why is this so significant? So this is significant because in the case of compressive phase retrieval, sparsity priors mathematically appear to fail, right? It's still an open problem to determine whether there is an efficient algorithm to recover a case or an S sparse signal X naught from O of S generic measurements. By generic measurements, I mean absolute value of Gaussians. Uh, so that is to say there's no structure in those that you're going to be able to exploit to like cheat to get to the signal, you know, through like some two-part process or something. You like really have to grapple with the challenge. Um, this, this is a, a famously challenging problem that, you know, many people in, in this area of applied mathematics have studied and not really made much progress on. There are some negative results showing that some existing methods, if you do the obvious tweak to make them work, they provably don't work. Um, and uh, so what's significant about this work with the, with, with, the, with the deep priors is that in contrast to sparsity priors, the deep priors can be, at least in theory, exploited at the optimal rate. Whereas we, can't, we don't have that condition uh, for a sparsity prior. That's an open question and my understanding is people conjecture it's not true. Um, so, so to go back to this picture, you know, so I want to say a little bit more about like what's going on, how can these generative models possibly even beat sparsity-based models? Right, so let's, let's give, do a little thought experiment. Um, so like if I have an image of this, like this train, I have a family of images of this train going down this track, right? How dimensional is that set of images? Well, morally speaking, that's roughly one dimensional, right? If I modeled that with sparsity priors and a wavelet basis or, you know, a discrete cosine transform, then I'm going to have to pay actually quite a high dimensionality to represent those images. But if I could go train a neural network to actually model that class in that low dimensional way, then I do have the chance of getting a representation of significantly lower complexity than the sparsity-based representations. So here we're, we're arriving at like two quite inspiring things. One is that in these nonlinear programs or nonlinear problems like phase retrieval, we can recover using a generative prior at optimal sample complexity relative to that prior. But there's also reason to believe that that optimal sample complexity is much less than the sparsity of the signal in a reasonable basis. Right? And so those, those, that's a double whammy for why these generative priors could really significantly outperform uh, sparsity-based priors. Uh, yes? So why do you assume that the network can actually represent this kind of sequence that you described as a one-dimensional kind of uh, a generative model, uh, whereas sparsity cannot? Because like, if you were to use each frame of this video, as a sparse basis, the sparsity would give you basically each one of the frames, right, when you pick it, uh, which would also be one-dimensional, uh, but why would the network be able to model it? I don't see that. Well, so, so here the, the point is that when, the, when you think about, like, I have a natural signal class, like, what is going on with a sparsity prior? What is going on with a deep general model? The deep general model is really learning a manifold that represents that natural signal class. And if you can do that well, that manifold could, in principle, really be the true, like the, the true complexity of that natural signal class. Whereas the sparsity prior is really saying that the image is in like the union of, a un, uh, of like combinatorially many subspaces. Uh, and so now you could, uh, like, like that, that situation is, is one where, like once you start saying like, like how many uh, coefficients uh, within that basis do you need, you generally will need more than one. Now, I'm sure that in, in a particular example like this, like, okay, you can probably find ways to, to, to get around it and like find that sort of that one dimensional situation in this case. But for a general case, uh, that's, that's much harder to do. Why do you um, think the network can do it? 
Well, so the, I mean, the, the empirical success of like deep general models, particularly those with low latent dimensional spaces, is, like the proof is in the pudding, right? Like they have relatively good approximations of that natural signal class as an explicit low dimensional manifold. So, and those models are, are only getting better and better over time. So part of it is a bit inspiration based on just the sheer pace of success, uh, the sheer pace of progress in that field, and um, aspiration that the computer scientists that are working on this are going to find ever better methods for doing so. I was there. But doesn't that, on the other hand, mean that it only applies to a certain family class of images, and if you go to something totally different, then you have your no solution? Yeah, so indeed, if you, like, so these models are trained off of data. Your data has some distribution. When you step out of that distribution, then, well, you can have problems. And so then there are other approaches, like other like general modeling approaches that, are, that you can show are actually more robust, for example, to distributional shift. Uh, and that's an interesting question of itself. Uh, but in general, these like deep learning based approaches, if you're, if you're learning from data, you, know, you are learning good things from data and you're learning bad things from data. Uh, and just as an example, like if we go back to like the black hole image that came out a year or two ago, how are you gonna find a data set to train on before you even know what it looks like, right? And that, that you know, okay, so that means that like deep learning based mo methods are not the only like thing that, that will survive scrutiny. Uh, but on the other hand, in those cases, then you get other tricky things like why are you assuming these other priors? Um, and that, that is itself an interesting question. Um, yes? In other words, what, if I may rephrase what you're saying, uh, please don't tell me if it's, if it's improperly said, but like, if you were to use a general model to correct, like, or to, to find solution in the compressed sensing, like, scheme, in the case of, like, let's say, ultrasonic imaging, where you train on a data set that is, like, very comprehensive, all the disease and condition you're trying to diagnose, then you would definitely get a very good diagnosis tool, but you may not necessarily get a good scientific tool in case it were to be used on new things that we haven't explored before. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so in, in some cases of imaging, you're specifically seeking to see new things. Those will be ones that are more challenging. In other cases, you're seeking to identify within a relatively well understood class. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so, so what, what I want to do is, is just show some, uh, well, just the, you know, I want to comment quickly, you know, that, you know, the, this theory applies to other problems. So uh, we worked on this with like denoising. So here in the denoising problem, right, you have an image, you have added noise. If you have n pixels uh, and you have like a k dimensional model and then you kind of restrict to that model, you should get like a denoising rate that's like k over n, right? Like the noise that's along your manifold you'll, will stay with you and the noise that's like perpendicular to it um, will stay, uh, will, will get removed. And so we show, you know, in this work with, with Reinhardt uh, and others, uh, that, um, that we get that optimal sampling rate for the denoising problem. Um, we also show that in the case of like spiked matrix recovery, this is like a case where you're doing like PCA. So imagine you have like a rank one matrix, say in this case it's written YY transpose, uh, and you have some like Gaussian noise added to it. You can recover that uh, with sort of the straightforward same style optimization problem, also with information theoretically optimal uh, scalings. Uh, that's another case where sparsity was not known to succeed and is conjectured to fail. Um, and then I have just a, a few minutes left, so I just want to comment briefly about advances to this theory. You know, we've had some, some, some wonderful questions so far, you know, particularly getting at like assumptions of the model. And there are a lot of assumptions there, including ones that we haven't really discussed yet. Uh, so, so for example, you know, so this, this paper, um, uh, out of some, some folks from MIT, like generalize the work to work for con uh, neural networks of convolutional structure. Right, so the, the work that we originally presented uh, was all about fully connected structure. So this encodes sort of these like convolutional layers. And so that was exciting to see that it extends even outside of just that case. Um, I also want to talk about you know, how, how the, the you know, expansivity assumption has been weakened. Right, so originally, and, and sort of like uh, the, the original work with Vlad Voroninsky, um, you know, we said that like each layer grows and it grows by like an n log n factor. Uh, so then uh, Daskalakis and others 
uh, did like a, a tighter analysis, uh, like really carefully controlling some like Lipschitz behavior in different directions, like remove that log factor. And so then they show that it suffice to, to have a neural network that just expands linearly at each layer. Then um, my, my former graduate student, Bob, uh, Babru Joshi, and collaborators of his at UBC actually showed that this is possible even if you have contractive layers. So, but there they needed this assumption that like the width, the width of each layer was like bigger than like five to the i times k, you know, so that allows for contraction, but like requires this like rapid growth with depth. Um, so that wasn't quite, you know, where, where we want the field to end up. Uh, but then um, my uh, former graduate student, Yorio Coca-Cola, uh, made this very interesting observation that actually all that we need is that the size of each layer to be roughly k, to be bigger than k. And he showed this through actually some really incredible technical analysis, um, which I won't go into. And can, if you're interested, I encourage you to go to his poster at NeurIPS tomorrow. Um, all right, so just the bottom line here, you know, there, there is a recovery theory for generative priors with uh, random models on those priors for multiple inverse problems. And there, there is a compelling case for why they should be able to outperform sparsity priors in a variety of problems, right? So, and in particular, they could provide tighter representations that are more optimally exploitable. So it's a double whammy um, for, for those. So now there's much more to say, and I refer you to any of these references for the works that I've talked about in this, um, in, in this talk. In particular, on the bottom right, there's a survey article that we've worked on you know, with, with, with Reinhardt, with Jonathan Scarlett, and Yonina Aldar, and others. Um, that sort of summarizes the uh, deep learning for inverse problems. So I encourage you to go look and read at that um, uh, at that review article. And I'll thank you at this moment for your time.